Hello everyone. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon. So today let's start, uh, let's continue with our listening practice and we have covered all four sections yesterday and today there is more of the lectures like how to listen to maps and how to do maps and all that stuff. Let, let's try to cover up as much as possible today and probably I will be doing this today in two parts because of the time constraint I have to go somewhere and then I will be back and I will continue so this is the part one for day four let's start and before that uh, there is one course that was remaining for, for how to man sorry uh, yes listening paraphrases so let's go through it once again how to listen to the paraphrasing and synonym quiz so just have a quick okay, okay. this is, is the paraphrasing paraphrase. synonym quiz c you've already wow. done quiz a and quiz b so you already know that this is working on your ability to recognize paraphrasing and synonyms and it's related to the ielts listening exam all the questions on the ielts listening exam relate to Just a minute, let me make some changes quickly so, so that the video can be visible. Or hearing synonyms or recognizing paraphrasing when it happens. On fill the blank questions, they're using synonyms or paraphrasing for the words that are before and after the blank line. If you don't hear the synonym, you missed the answer choice. Is that easy? Hear the synonym and the answer choice is connected to it. For the multiple choice questions, they will say the keywords in the question using synonyms or paraphrasing, and then they will say the answer choice. And then your job is from the selection of A, B, and C to choose which one is a paraphrase for what they said. So paraphrasing is so, so important. If you want to get better at paraphrasing, you have to learn vocabulary. You have to learn vocabulary. And in this course, we have a section that provides all of the really great vocabulary that you need. All of our vocabulary is related to synonyms because that's, what you re that's really what you need to study, our synonyms. Okay, so let's go ahead and do quiz number C, or quiz letter C. In terms of the instructions, you need paper and pencil to create a table, a two-sided table. On the left, you have the question keywords. On the right, you write the synonyms and paraphrasing of those question keywords. The questions and answers, for the most part, go in order. I tried to design it that way so it goes in order because the exam goes in order. And then stopping and starting is perfectly fine because when you hear the paraphrase for question number one or the keywords in question number one, you may need time to write them down on your table. And so in this instance, you can stop and start. On the real exam, you cannot do that, everybody. As you know, we're not answering the questions. Please don't ask about where are the questions, where are they. This is, that's not what this is about. Our focus is synonym and paraphrase recognition. So let's move into the next quiz. Quiz number six. The purpose of this quiz is to test your ability to recognize synonym language and paraphrasing. We are not answering any questions. Your only job is to hear and write down the synonym or paraphrase of the question keywords. So for this one, the question keywords are his difficulty, discuss main topics, range of uses, use in one hand, consider omitting, provide an example, summarize, lacked conclusion, not enough, sometimes distracting, and not too technical. So you're listening for the paraphrasing or synonym for these question keywords. So if you, need, if you need time and you want to write these on the left side of your table, go ahead and stop the lecture right now. Stop the quiz right now and write down those keywords. You don't have to, but on the right side, you're going to write down the paraphrasing and the synonyms that you hear for those question keywords. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and start the audio. Uh, come in, Russ. Thank you. Now, you wanted to consult me about your class presentation on nanotechnology. You're due to give it next week, aren't you? That's right, and I'm really struggling. I chose the topic because I didn't know much about it and wanted to learn more. But now I've read so much about it, in a way there's too much to say. I could talk for much longer than the 20 minutes I've been allocated. Should I assume the other students don't know much and give them a kind of general introduction? Or should I try and make them share my fascination with a particular aspect? 
You could do either, but you'll need to have it clear in your own mind. Then I think I'll give an overview. OK. Now, one way of approaching this is to work through developments in chronological order. Uh-huh. On the other hand, you could talk about the numerous ways that nanotechnology is being applied. You mean things like thin films on camera displays to make them water repellent and additives to make motorcycle helmets stronger and lighter? Exactly. Or another way would be to focus on its impact in one particular area, say medicine or space exploration. That would make it easier to focus. Perhaps I should do that. I think that would be a good idea. Right. How important is it to include slides in the presentation? They aren't essential by any means. And there's a danger of tailoring what you say to fit whatever slides you can find. While it can be good to include slides, you could end up spending too long looking for suitable ones. You might find it better to leave them out. I see. Another thing I was wondering about was how to start. I know presentations often begin with, first I'm going to talk about this, and then I'll talk about that. But I thought about asking the audience what they know about nanotechnology. That would be fine if you had an hour or two for the presentation, but you might find that you can't do anything with the answers you get, and it simply eats into the short time that's available. So maybe I should mention a particular way that nanotechnology is used to focus people's attention. That sounds sensible. What do you think I should do next? I really have to plan the presentation today and tomorrow. Well, initially, I think you should ignore all the notes you've made, take a small piece of paper and write a single short sentence that ties together the whole presentation. It can be something as simple as, nanotechnology is already improving our lives. Then start planning the content around that. You can always modify that sentence later if you need to. OK. OK. Now let's think about actually giving the presentation. You've only given one before, if I remember correctly, about an experiment you'd been involved in. That's right. It was pretty rubbish. Let's say it was better in some respects than in others. With regard to the structure, I felt that you ended rather abruptly, without rounding it off. Be careful not to do that in next week's presentation. OK. And you made very little eye contact with the audience because you were looking down at your notes most of the time. You need to be looking at the audience and only occasionally glancing at your notes. Mm. Your body language was a little odd. Every time you showed a slide, you turned your back on the audience so you could look at it. You should have been looking at your laptop. And you kept scratching your head, so I found myself wondering when you were next going to do that instead of listening to what you were saying. Oh, dear. What did you think of the language? I knew that not everyone was familiar with the subject, so I tried to make it as simple as I could. Yes, that came across. You used a few words that are specific to the field, but you always explained what they meant, so the audience wouldn't have had any difficulty understanding. Uh-huh. I must say, the handouts you prepared were well thought out, they were a good summary of your presentation, which people would have been able to refer to later on. So well done on that. Thank you. Well, I hope that helps you with next week's presentation. Yes, it will. Thanks a lot. I'll look forward to seeing a big improvement then. All right, let's take a look at the answer choices. So when he said his difficulty, the audio paraphrasing was really struggling. Discuss main topics, give a general overview. Range of uses, the audio paraphrasing is numerous ways applied, used in one field. The audio similar language is focus one particular area. Consider omitting, might find better to leave out. Provide an example, mention a particular way used. Summarize, ties together the whole presentation. Lack conclusion, ended abruptly. Not enough, you made very little. Sometimes distracting, just when it's talked about odd body language, you could have had that in there. Turned back, scratched head, what to do next. Uh, not too technical, the audience wouldn't have difficulty understanding. So when you're doing, this, is, this, this one is actually from a section three part. When you're doing those sections, you have to be able to hear this paraphrasing. And then you have to be able to find the match, right? So you, you have to be able to do that. If you're not able to do that, 
it's a big, big problem in terms of finding the answer choices. You have to hear the audio, audio paraphrasing and synonym language. This is what I'm trying to help you get better at doing to improve your ear. Because on those multiple choice questions, that's what's happening. They're speaking in the conversation. Your first job is to hear the question keywords, and they may be paraphrasing or using synonyms for the question keywords. Whatever the answer choice is, whatever the answer choice is, is connected to those question keywords. So they either said the answer right before those question keywords or more likely right after those question keywords. Then your job is to be able to quickly find the paraphrase of what they said. Your job is not to listen for which answer has words that I hear. That's not an English test. That's going against the, the spirit of the entire exam when you're doing that because you're not testing somebody's listening ability to hear the same word. A basic level student can do that. So listening for paraphrasing is extremely important on those section three and section four questions. And I hope this quiz has helped you get a little bit better and really helped you understand about what you need to work on. Let's move into the next quiz. Here is quiz number seven. The purpose of this quiz is to test your ability to recognize synonym language and paraphrasing. We are not answering any questions. Your only job is to hear and write down the synonym paraphrase of the question keyword. All right, so here we only have four questions. And the question keyword for number one, people going back to college. Number two, two days. Number three, clarity. And number four, you're listening for paraphrase or synonym for encourage interest in learning. So let's play the audio. Good luck. And write down that paraphrasing and synonym on the right side of your table. Hello, um, I'm Dawn Matthews. Yes, hello. I've been referred to you because I'm inquiring about the refresher courses that you run. I'd like to find out a bit more about them. OK. Well, we run quite a few different short courses for students who are either returning to study or studying part-time. Um, tell me about your situation. Well... I think that I really need some help in preparing for the coming semester, uh, especially to build up my confidence a bit and um, help me study effectively because, you see, I've been out in the workforce for nearly 12 years now, so it really is a long time since I was last a student. Yes, it can seem like a long time, can't it? <laughs> um, well, let me start by telling you what courses we have that might suit you. Are you an undergraduate or a postgraduate? Arts or Sciences? Undergraduate, and I'm in the Business Faculty. Right, then. Well, first of all, there's our Intensive Study for Success seminar on the 1st and 2nd of February. Mm -hmm. It's aimed at students like you who are uncertain about what to expect at college and looks at a fairly wide range of approaches to university learning mm. to motivate you to begin your study and build on your own learning strategies. Mm, that sounds good. Uh, what are some of the strategies that are presented? Well, we try to cover all aspects of study. Some of the strategies in writing, for example, would be improving your planning for writing, organising your thinking, and building some techniques to help you write more clearly. With reading, there'll be sessions aimed at getting into the habit of analysing material as you read it, mm. and tips to help you record and remember what you've read. It really is very important to begin reading confidently right from the beginning. Mm. There's also advice on how to get the most from your lectures and practice in giving confident presentations, as well as how to prepare for exams. What about the motivational side of things? Ah, well, there's a range of motivational exercises that we do to help the students feel positive and enthusiastic about their study. The process of learning and exploring a subject can lead to a whole new way of looking at the world, and the study skills and techniques that you build up can be applied in all sorts of different ways. Okay, let's take a look at the answer choices. For number one, people going back to college, the audio paraphrasing, been a long time since I was last a student. Number two, two days, the audio similar language it was first and second of february number three clarity planning organizing thinking number four encourage interest in learning feel positive and enthusiastic about study so that is the paraphrasing that you should have heard that related to the question keywords thank you so much for doing these quizzes i really hope they have added to your ability to do much better on the ielts listening section remember you can create your own quizzes you can create your own and in fact it's better to do it 
with practice tests that you've already done before because you've, you've already identified the answer choices. And now what you're doing is going through those questions and pulling out the keywords from the questions and, uh, the, and the answer selections. And your job is to just listen for synonyms. Listen and write down synonyms. Keep practicing that on your own and you're working on that skill. Then on the real exam, you're going to do great. All right, so take care, have a great day, and I'll talk to you in the next lecture. Hello students, in this lecture, we're going to be working on map directional language. So let's go ahead and get into it. The focus of this lecture is first to give you some advice about the map, about the map question. Then I'm going to provide some directional language overview and we're going to end with some directional language examples. Now, this lecture is broken up into two parts. This is part number one, and the following lecture is part number two. Map directional language is really, really important because probably the main reason why students have trouble with the map question is they don't understand the terminology. When somebody says around the bend, or until you reach, or on the far side, when they're using that type of directional positional language, a lot of students get lost. And so the focus of this lecture is to really help you understand the map directional terminology. We're not going to be answering questions. That's going to come in the later lectures that you're going to be able to have. Right now, it's all about learning this terminology. And so the way it's going to work is we're going to give you a list of terminology, and you're going to see a map that's related to the terminology that's going to be used. And we will read sentences. I will read sentences using that terminology. And you can just follow along on the map as I'm reading the sentences. But your main job here is to listen to the directional language so you can understand what it means. And then on the real exam, you won't have any problems. So in terms of map labeling, here's some advice. Read the instructions, know the vocabulary of location, know the vocabulary of position. That's the focus of this lecture here. That's what I need you to know because I want you to do very, very well on the exam. Now, one thing that's really tricky, one aspect that you have to watch for on the map labeling is they love to use the passive voice. Very often they'll speak using the passive voice. And sometimes that can be tricky for students to follow. And so you want to become accustomed to when they're speaking that they, they, they will use the passive voice from time to time. You want to note the buildings that are already identified on a map that can really help you find where, where the things are located. Find clues, look where, look where the unstated items are on the map, the compass, the path, the train tracks, the bridge. Notice where the unstated, unidentified items are because they're probably going to use them when they're, when they're telling you where something is. You want to understand perspective. This may seem crazy, but you know some people think they're inside the map. And really, you're observing. You're, look, you're looking at the map. So it's from your perspective. You're not in the map. You're not in, inside the map walking around. And then predict the answer type. Sometimes you can predict if it's going to be a verb, adverb, or noun. So use your prediction powers. In terms of directional language, it will relate to, of course, direction or location. And you have to know your places. All of this vocabulary is really, really important to learn. And that's the, that's the mission of this lecture, is to make sure that at the end, at the end of these next two lectures, when someone says, carry on down the path, and you'll find the store at the end. You know, when they're using that language, you have to really understand it. So here we have some directional and positional language examples for you. Now, I'm going to include a resource that you can download that has all of this directional and positional language so you don't have to write it all, write it all down right here. I'm going to give you a PDF resource so that you can download it to your system and you'll be able to review this vocabulary and learn it. So let's go ahead and look at example number one. Remember, the purpose of the exercise is to follow along with and understand directional language. The purpose is not to answer questions that occurs later. We will present the directional vocabulary, read sentences using that vocabulary, and then later on we'll show you those sentences. So here you can see a map on the left side. The answers, all, the answers are already on the map because that's not, what, that's not what this is about here. Here we're focusing on understanding terminology. In the sentences that I read, you're going to hear carry on, here at, follow the path, on your left, further down the path, on the right, around the first sharp bend, to your left, keep on the path around the second bend on your right until you reach side entrance situated in between and far side of. Now, here are the sentences. Please listen carefully and you're welcome to follow along on the map as I read. You are here at the information center. 
follow the path and the orchard is the first area on your left. Number three, walk further down the path and the garden is on your left. Number four, go around the first sharp bend and to your left, you will see Pear Alley. Number five, keep on the path for Mulberry Garden, round the second bend and you'll find it on your right. Number six, carry on until you reach the house. Number seven, to find the shop, leave the side entrance of the house and it's situated between the house and the garage. Number eight, the tea room is on the far side of the garage. Now let's take a look at those sentences. And here you have those sentences. So if you need to, you can stop the lecture right here and read through the sentences. I have put the directional language in yellow, but really what we're working on everybody is you learning this terminology. Let's move on to example number two. Again, the purpose is to allow you, is to really to follow along with and understand directional language. There won't be any answering of any questions. We're gonna present the vocabulary, read the sentences, and then show you those sentences. So here is the language used. You can see the, the map or the diagram on the left-hand side. So we're going to hear left-hand side, right-hand side, beyond, along, turn right, corner, corridor, go straight, to your right, across from, adjacent to, northeast corner, eastern wall, go straight, pass through, head west, beside, on the other side, next to, facing, and the word entrance. Okay, and here are the sentences. When you enter the sports center, the sports shop is on the left-hand side. Number two, as you are facing the reception, the cafe is on the right-hand side. Number three, pass through the entrance, right, you will see the cafe. Adjacent to that, you will find a changing room. Number four, the leisure pool is on the opposite side of the center from the dance studios. Number five, head west, pass the sports shop, and you will find the entrance to a changing room. Number six, walk along the sports hall corridor, the sports shop, and you will find the... Number four, the leisure pool is on the opposite side of the center from the dance studios. Number five, head west, pass the sports shop, and you will find the entrance to a changing room. Number six, walk along the sports hall corridor, go past the two dance studios, and at the next aisle, turn left to reach the gym. Number seven, the dance studio is in the northeast corner. Number eight, the 25-meter pool is in between a changing room and the seating area. Number nine, go straight along the corridor beside the sports hall and you will see two dance studios on the Eastern wall. Now let's take a look at those sentences. And here you can see those sentences that I just read. Please take the time to pause right here if you need to, read through the sentences, look at the map as you're reading the sentences and learn the terminology. The purpose of this exercise is for you to learn the terminology. Let's go to the next example. Okay, example number three. Remember the purpose is to understand directional language terminology. The language we'll use just south, southeast corner, located between, look north, in between, middle, west of, and northern end. Here are the sentences. Look at the map. I'm going to go ahead and read the sentences related to that language. Just south of the station, you will find the car park in the southeast corner. Number two, the swimming pool is located between the indoor arena and stadium. Number three, from the tower, look north and you can find the cafe right in the middle of the trees. Number four, to the west of the tower, you can see the rose garden with benches to enjoy the view. Number five, you will find the stadium at the northern end of the train tracks.
And here are those sentences related to the language that we used. Please take your time to read through them and recognize the terminology, learn it, so that when you hear it, it becomes second nature to you. All right, so coming up next, we're going to definitely give you some more directional language analysis and part two in terms of the part two of the examples. So let's go ahead and go to the next lecture. Thank you so much for joining me and let's keep working together to help you get the best score possible. Hello again, we're now going to go through the lecture for map directional language, this is part number two. So keep in mind what we're doing is learning the terminology, the terminology for being able to label a map so that when they're using all of this terminology, this weird terminology that you may or may not have heard before, or you've heard it before, but maybe not in a certain context, I'm gonna be reading sentences to you using that terminology to help it become second nature to you. So here's example number four. The purpose of the exercise is to follow along with and understand directional language. The purpose is not to answer questions that comes later. We will present the directional vocabulary, read sentences using that vocabulary, and then show you those sentences. Remember, you're going to be able to see a map that's related to the directional sentences that we're using. Your job is to really better understand the terminology. Okay, and for this map, you're going to hear the language opposite, north, right at the third bend, side street in between, east of, junction, across from, across the road from, same side, pass before you get to dead end leads off and west of so here are the sentences again look at the map as i'm reading the sentences and learn the terminology the chemist is opposite a supermarket travel north of the supermarket and right at the third bend you will find the new no parking sign to the west of the school. I will north of the supermarket and learn the terminology. The chemist is opposite a supermarket. Travel north of the supermarket and right at the third bend. You will find the new no parking sign to the west of the school. Number three, if you travel on the side street in between the bank and chemist, you will see parking east of the bank. Number four, the new traffic light is located at the junction of Station Road and High Street. Number five, the pedestrian crossing will be located across from the supermarket. Number six, they are going to build new houses across the road from the school at point G. Number seven, there is a supermarket on the same side of the road as the library. Number eight, walk west along High Street and you'll pass the library before you get to the junction with Station Road. Number nine, the bank is on a dead end road that leads off High Street. And here are our sentences. Number nine, it should read, the bank is on a dead end road that leads off High Street, not off the High Street, off High Street. Read through the sentences. And as you're reading through the sentences, really pay attention to the location vocabulary. I hope this is really helping you out in terms of learning this terminology because this is what it's about. When, when, you, when, when you want to do well for the map question and labeling, if you know terminology very well, you're going to be okay. Let's move on to example five. The language that you're going to hear 
situated in the southwest bend outside above the to the west parallel to adjoining enter the west on your right carry straight on on your left around the next bend south in between and east now what's interesting to note is this diagram that you're looking at this map that you're looking at this is really an academic task number one map but it's great for teaching directional vocabulary it's great for teaching directional vocabulary because that's what this is about this is about teaching you terminology i can use a, a task one map and really show you and teach you really good terminology. I'm, let's all focus on vocabulary, everybody. Now, here are the sentences. Here's the map vocabulary used in a sentence. Number one, the school is situated in the southwest bend of the dual carriageway, specifically on the outside of it. Number two, the bus station is above the shop and to the west of the shopping center. Number three, the town center has a pedestrian walkway running parallel to a row of adjoining shops. Number four, as you enter the carriageway from the west, proceed south, passing the school on your right, and then carry straight on, and you'll see the park on your left around the next bend. Number five, the shopping center is located between the bus station and car park. Number six, one of the new housing is located south of the shops and west of the park. And number seven, there is a set of housing located east of the school and on the outside of the carriageway. Here are those sentences. All right, so take your time, pause here if you need to. Read through each sentence, learn this terminology, learn the map terminology, and I want you to score perfectly when you're faced with a map question on the listening exam. Example six. All right, so now this one is actually from a listening test, and here is the terminology that we're going to learn from this map. North, northwest, just before, starting point, first left, pass, keep going, in front of, end of, follow the path, veer right, carry on, on the right, head north, across, turn left, small path, immediately turn left, before you reach. Okay, let's read through the sentences. Number one. Walk north of the main entrance, and just before the south gate, we find the walking wall's starting point. Two, take the first left from the main entrance, pass the bridge, keep going, and you will find the museum in front of you at the end of the road. Number three, follow the path north from the main entrance, and just before the south gate, veer right. Okay, let's read through the sentences. Number one, walk north of the main entrance and just before the south gate, we find the walking wall's starting point. Number two, take the first left from the main entrance, pass the bridge, keep going, and you will find the museum in front of you at the end of the road. Number three, follow the path north from the main entrance, and just before the south gate, veer right, carry on, and you'll find the birdhouse on the right before you reach the tower. Number four, head north of the birdhouse and across the bridge, you will find the stage. Number five, northwest of the south gate, you will find the great hall. Number six, follow the path north from the main entrance and turn right before the south gate. Travel the path and turn left onto the small path before the birdhouse. And at the end of the track, you will find the shop. Number seven, leave the main entrance and immediately turn left. And before you reach the bridge, 
make a right and proceed to the main office at the end of the path. Okay, so let's take a look at those sentences. And in bold, you can see, in bold black, you can see a lot of the directional language that was used. Go ahead and take your time. One thing to note here uh, that I also missed Time and read through. was when he says pass the bridge, I was thinking cross the bridge. So this is confusing vocabulary. Pass and cross. So take the first left till, till here we are correct. And then whether to cross the bridge, it is G. But if you pass the bridge, it is D. And it says pass the bridge. Keep going and you will find the museum in the front of you at the end of the road so this is the end of the road and this is we are passing the bridge and because here in the next sentence across the bridge so across the bridge is a for the stage this process it digest it and when you hear it on the exam you'll be you'll know exactly what to do and how to find whatever they're asking you to locate Okay, let's go ahead on to map directional language practice, example number seven. Remember, the purpose is for you to follow along with and understand directional language. So I really hope that you're getting a better grasp on how to really recognize directions when you hear them, because that's the whole key to doing well on a map question. Remember, the purpose is not to answer the questions now. You're only trying to make sure you can follow along as I'm giving the directional language. So let's go ahead and get started. So some of the directional language here are top of, north, head west, opposite, turn right, when you reach, far side, another left, go past, around the curving bend, on the left, second left, just behind, between. So you're going to listen out for those directional words, and let's go ahead and try to follow along. You can see we're looking at a map here. And with a lot of maps, they start down here at the Tourist Information Center, and you can look and notice all of the different points or, or, or centers on the map. We have the cafe, the railway station, the supermarket, the bike hire, the museum, town hall, mountain road, supply store, ski passes. They indicate for you that this, this uh, marking here indicates an old railway line. So these are all of, this is all of the language that you need to really listen out for um, as, we're going, as we're going through this example. So when I go to the next screen, go ahead and listen, start listening very, very carefully and try to follow along with what I'm doing or follow along with what I'm saying so that you can make sure that you understand map directional language. All right, so let's get started with number one. At the top of Willow Lane, north of the pond, head east on Pine Street, and opposite the old railway station, you will find the supermarket. Number two, leave the tourist information center and turn right. Head towards Pine Street. And when you reach Pine Street, on the far side of the train tracks, you will see the cafe. Number three, leaving the tourist information center, turn left. Then make another left on Pine Street. Go past Mountain Road on the right and then, and then head down around the curving bend where you will find the supply store on the right. Number four, from the supermarket, head west on Pine Street. Go past the pond, make the second left and just behind the town hall you'll find the museum. Number five, the bike hire is located between the supermarket and town hall on the southern side of the, on the southern side of Pine Street.
So let's look at that one more time. At the top of Willow Lane, north of the pond, here's the pond, this is north of the pond, head east on Pine Street, and opposite the old railway station, you will find the supermarket. Number two says, leave the Tourist Information Center, turn right, head towards Pine Street, and when you reach Pine Street, on the far side of the train tracks, you'll see the cafe. Number three says, leaving the Tourist Information Center, turn left. Then make another left on Pine Street. Go past Mountain Road on the right, and then head down around the curving bend where you'll find a supply store on the right. Then number four says, from the supermarket, head west on Pine Street, go past the pond, make the second left, here's the first left, make the second left, and just behind the town hall, behind the town hall, you'll find the museum. And then number five says, the bike hire is located between the supermarket and town hall on the southern side of Pine Street. All right, so thank you very much for participating in this map directional exercise. I really hope that you understand how to handle a map question much better now. Thank you so much for taking this course. It's great having you with me. I'll talk. Really hope that you understand. Thank you so much for taking. Okay, in this next lecture, we're going to be looking at um, doing a map. And when you're looking at a map, it's not very complicated to do. It goes in order, all right? It always goes in order. And what I mean by that is um, they're going to do 17 first for bird hide. Then they're going to talk about the dog walking area, then flower garden, then the wooded area. So when you have a map, you have to make sure that you have time. You take the time to really look carefully at the map where things are. Because they're going to tell you, they're going to tell you where these items are, 17 through 20, in relationship to things on the map. So look at things on the map. Like this says refreshments, west gate, east gate, right? We have a circle in the middle and we have a lake. So they're going to use those landmarks to tell you where these things are, okay? So you have to be very good at following. You also have to understand direction language. Up, down, left, right, upper corner, left, bottom corner, right, next to, behind, in front of, on top of. So you have to know that kind of language. So listen carefully and see if you can listen for the right language so you know where things go on the map. And finally, I'd like to tell you about our new wildlife area, Hinchingbrook Park, which will be opened to the public next month. This slide doesn't really indicate how big it is, but anyway, you can see the two gates into the park and the main paths. As you can see, there's a lake in the northwest of the park with a bird hide to the west of it at the end of a path. So it'll be a nice, quiet place for watching the birds on the lake. Fairly close to where refreshments are available, there's a dog walking area in the southern part of the park leading off from the path. And if you just want to sit and relax, you can go to the flower garden. That's the circular area on the map, surrounded by paths. And finally, there's a wooded area in the western section of the park, between two paths. OK, that's enough from me, so let's get on and have a OK, so our correct answers were for number 17, for bird hide, it was A. Because they said it was, it was on the west, it was west of the lake, Here's the lake. Where's the west? West of the lake at the end of the path. That means the answer is A. West of the lake, west of the lake at the end of the path. These are paths. These white lines. So here is an update. I, I, I messed up right and left. And that's called a path, path, right, where, right, you, walk. where you walk. End of the end lake, of the lake. West, west, west of the lake, end of the path, right? So that's where that goes right there. Uh, number 18 was I, because they said, they said, they talked about the refreshments. They said the dog walking area was next to the refreshments. And where's there, that, the, the, the correct answer would be I. For number F, they said the flower garden was in the circular area. That means the answer must be F, right? Flower garden is in the circular area. And number 20, um, the wooded area, 
is near, near the west gate, near the west gate, between two paths. Here's one path. Here's the other path. What's in between? E. Okay. So the correct answers were uh, A I F E. A I F E. All right. You just have to be able to follow the path. Follow follow where things are so that you can know where where to go. All right. So um, let's go ahead and do uh, do another map so you can maybe get a little bit more comfortable with how to do them. Okay, so here we have another map, and on this map, we it's very important for us to again look at where everything is. That's what we have to do. Let's look at where everything is on the map. Okay, and when we're looking at them, we have the goals in order from 17 to 20, box office, theater manager's office, lighting box, artistic director's office. So look at the map and look where things are. Here's the the road, entrance, foyer, double doors, uh, entrance, there's the water cooler. So it's very important that we're able to look at a map and know where everything is on the map, right? Know where everything is on the map because that's what they're going to tell that's where they're going to tell us these things are in reference to the map. So listen carefully and uh, and please uh, write down your answers. And then of course I'll go over with you about the map itself. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 17 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 17 to 20. Now, a word about the layout of the building. The auditorium, stage and dressing rooms for the actors are all below ground level. Here on the ground floor, we have most of the rooms that the public doesn't see. The majority are internal, so they have windows in the roof to light them. Standing here in the foyer, you're probably wondering why the box office isn't here, where the public would expect to find it. Well, you might have noticed it on your way in. Although it's part of this building, it's next door, with a separate entrance from the road. For the theatre manager's office, you go across the foyer and through the double doors. Turn right, and it's the room at the end of the corridor with the door on the left. The lighting box is where the computerized stage lighting is operated and it's at the back of the building. When you're through the double doors, turn left, turn right at the water cooler and right again at the end. It's the second room along that corridor. The lighting box has a window into the auditorium, which of course is below us. The artistic director's office is through the double doors, turn right, and it's the first room you come to on the right-hand side. And finally, for the moment, the room where I'll take you next, the relaxation room. So, if you'd like to come with me. That is the end of section two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Okay, let's have a look at our answers. I'm going, to back, I'm going to pause and back the tape up for you and so I can get it to the right spot. And we'll listen to it again and I'll kind of walk you through each one, each one step by step. We fix the tape for you. Okay, so let's listen to it again and I'm going to point out the answers for you. Now, when you're doing a map, you have to... Really, I, I really think you should use your pencil. Use your pencil to really follow where they're telling you to do. You have to follow the directions, follow the instructions. So I'm going to point this out for you step by step. All right. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop it for each one and kind of take you through what they're doing. But you have to be able to really follow directions. Now, a word about the layout of the building. The auditorium, stage and dressing rooms for the actors are all below ground level. Here on the ground floor, we have most of the rooms that the public doesn't see. The majority are internal, so they have windows in the roof to light them. Standing here in the foyer, you're probably wondering why the box office isn't here, where the public would expect to find it. Well, you might have noticed it on your way in, 
Although it's part of this building, it's next door with a separate entrance from the road. Right, it's next door with a separate entrance from the road. This is the normal entrance where the four foyer. That's the main entrance. They said it's another entrance, right? So the answer would be G for number 17. It's a different entrance. It's not here, so it can't be, it's not here. So it's not this entrance, it's at the other entrance. That means the answer is G for number 17. For the theater manager's office, you go across the foyer and through the double doors. Turn right, and it's the room at the end of the corridor, with the door on the left. Right, go through the double doors, right, is that that's the room at the end of the corridor with a door on the left, so that's D. Right, the theater, theater manager's office is D. It's not G, G was the first one, it's D, because it's the door on the left, end of the hall, on the left. The lighting box is where the computerized stage lighting is operated, and it's at the back of the building. When you're through the double doors, turn left, turn right at the water cooler, and right again at the end. It's the second room along that corridor. So that's B. Through the double doors, turn left, right at the water cooler, turn right again, right? The answer would be B, as in boy. The artistic director's office is through the double doors, turn right, and it's the first room you come to on the right-hand side. And finally, for the moment, the room where I'll take you next, the relaxation room. Right, go through the double doors, turn right, first room on the right, that has to be F. Okay, first room on the right. So that's what I mean. You have to be able to follow instructions, follow directions. If you're able to follow instructions and follow directions, then you're going to have a much better chance of, of doing well. Okay, much better chance of doing well. Okay, so that's how we do our maps. And those are, if you have a map that you want to let me know, and I'll, I'll kind of, I'll, okay? So I'll talk to you soon. That might be something you're not doing right on your end. But if I have, I have the questions on the screen right now, and when I'm playing the audio, you should be able to, you should be able to still hear everything. All right. Okay. All right. So I'm going to the next part, which is, which is a map. Okay. Now, when it comes to maps, when it comes to maps, a lot of students have trouble with the map, okay? And when it comes to maps, you have to really start making sure that you're able to really recognize map language. Now, when I'm looking at a map, I'll, I'll tell you the things that I'm, I'm looking at when I'm looking at a map. I'm looking at everything that, I'm looking at markers, right? I'm looking at markers when I'm looking at the map. So I'm looking at, I'm looking at, okay, here's the bank, right? I'm looking at that city road. I'm looking at what? That's Hill Road. Right. Who knows? Who knows what this is called right here? Right. This little road up here above Hill Road. What is that called? Does anybody know? What kind of road is that called? Because if you know what kind of road that's called, that really helps you be able to listen. Nobody knows. <laughs> I really say a curve one. All right. You, yeah. 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 But you have to know. No, no, no. Bumpy. All right. So, yeah, this is the problem, guys. You have to know that this in English is called a winding road. That's what it's called. It's called a winding road. Right. I know that there's the public garden. All right, I know that there's the Station Square, and I know there's Crawley Road. I also have to make sure that I know about West, North, East, and Southwest, North, and East, or it's North, East, Southwest, right? I got to know my directions. But if you're not able to recognize, you know, like, for example, Choice D, how would you describe the small road for Choice D, right? Is, what is, how is this described? Does anybody know? How would you describe that road? Narrow, okay. So you might say what? Narrow. Right, a narrow diagonal road, right? It's di it, run it runs at a diagonal, all right? It's narrow or small. No, this, this little part right here above G, how would you describe that? This little, this little road right here, how would you describe that road? The one that's going from G. Closed. Right, so dead end, exactly. So when you're looking, when you, you should, in order to make maps easy, you have to improve your vocabulary. It's an English test. Right. It's an English test. So you have to be able to recognize. Right. How would you if you're looking at C, how would you describe C? Where, where is C? How would anybody describe where C is? Where is C located? Does anybody know? No, not straight. All right. Maybe maybe intersection. All right. But most of the time when you see something like C. Right. It's going to be described as a cross from something. Right. It wouldn't. It wouldn't be at the inner. It wouldn't be at the. It wouldn't be at the. 
it wouldn't be um, intersection, right? But normally, if a, if, a, if, a, if, a, if a mark is across from a building, they're going to say across from, right? Across from, or they opposite to the bank. Yes, they might say opposite to the bank. They may say what? South, on the south side from the bank, and they may use directional language. All right. Now, what's the English word? And the, the reason why I'm going over this with you guys in terms of, in terms of language is because it's very, some people don't, don't get this part of making maps easy. What do you call this part where you have Hill Road and City Road? Where, where Hill Road and City Road come together, what do you call that in English? Also might say facing. What do you call that? No, no, it's not intersection. Yes, Robbie. All right, it's called a what? It's called a junction. Right? That's the that's the English word they're going to refer to. So if you don't have the language, guys, that's what makes the that's what makes the map difficult. All right, this small this small part that's running right here along along H. Right, this small part that's running along H. What do you call that part? The small little part going up from H into the garden. Does anybody know what that's called? Narrow straight road. Well, it's not a road because there are no cars on it. No, no. It's not a block. All right. All right. So it could be referred to, it could be possibly referred to as a, most likely, you'll be referred to as a footpath, right? Could be referred to as a passageway, right? Could be referred to as a, but it's not really a walk path, Abdul, it'll be referred to as a footpath. All right. So we all have to remember they're testing our English. These are the English words they expect you to know. Right. These are the English words you expect. They expect you to know other English words. They expect you to know facing. What does it mean when it says facing? Right. What does that mean? Up through. What does up through mean? Leads off. Right. There's a lot of language that relates to direction that you have to know. And if you don't know what facing means or what does it mean to go up through or what does it mean to lead off from? Right. All this kind of language. This is all language. Same side. Right. So all these words I've mentioned. All right. And there are more words. When you look at other maps, you come across different words. But that's why knowing how to practice is so important. That's why knowing how to practice is so important. A lot of you guys make the mistake of just taking one test and taking another test and taking another test and taking another test and you keep getting the same result. You're not doing the things to be able to improve your score, right? So when you're looking at a map or you're practicing with a map, there's so many things you should be, you could be, you could be, we haven't even started answering the question yet, right? And I'm trying to really break down for you how you have to go about analyzing and looking at a question so that you can improve, right? It's not always about taking a practice test. Sometimes you're working on other skills, Sometimes you might listen to an audio and say, let me try and listen for all this. The, if I hear any type of new directional language or map language I've never heard before, let me just listen for that kind of stuff. I'm not even answering the questions. Because the better my vocabulary gets with these kind of questions, the easier it's going to be. Okay? All right. So um, now let's go ahead and answer. Right? Keep in mind. Keep in mind. What? Hold on. Somebody asked me a question. These kind of questions, does direction mark given? No, they don't give you the direction marks. No, Kareem, you have to, they're going to, they're going to say them. You have to be able to, when you hear, when you hear the direction markers or the placement markers, you have to recognize where they're talking about, right? So again, like I said, first step one is put in your memory where Hill Road is, put in your memory where City Road is, put in your memory where Public Garden is, where Crawley Road is, where Station is, where the bank is, where the winding road is. Put those markers in your mind, all right? But no, they're not going to tell, they're not, they're not giving you the markers, okay? But you got to put those in your mind. Okay. All right. I'm going to go ahead and play it. Now, remember, these, these go in order. They go in order. So um, first you're going to hear 15, then 16, then 17, then 18, then 19, and then you're going to hear 20, right? All the questions for IELTS listening go in order. All right. They go in order. So the first thing they're going to tell you is where Reynolds House is. Okay. Then they're going to tell you where the thumb is, then the museum. It never goes out of order. All right. Ibrahim, you shouldn't be trying. I mean, when you're talking about memorizing, what are you talking about memorizing? I think within 30 seconds, you're not memorizing it. Okay. You're not. There's no, what are you trying to memorize? Where's your role? Public Garden's your role. You're, you're just putting, you're looking at where things are on the map. There's nothing to memorize. The map is right in front of your face, right? You're not required to memorize anything, okay? But you should know all this vocabulary before you even walk in the test. Junction, footpath, passageway, facing up through, leads off, same inside, winding road across from, short, closed, right? All that language you should already know, all right? But there's no requirement to memorize. Okay, I'm about, I'm about to play the audio and uh, answer the best way that you can, please. And then I'll go through everything and point it out for you.
after 6 p.m., many of the car parks have a flat rate which varies, but it is usually very reasonable. Before you hear the rest of the podcast, you have some time to look at questions 15 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 15 to 20. The sheep market is one of the main centres for art and history in the whole of the country. If you look at our map, you'll see some of the main attractions there. Most visitors start from Crawley Road at the bottom of the map. The Reynolds House is one of the oldest houses in the city and is open to the public. It's on the north side of Crawley Road next to the footpath that leads to the public gardens. The area is particularly interesting for its unusual sculptures. The thumb is just what its name suggests, but it's about 10 metres high. You'll see it on Hill Road, across the road from the bank. The museum's got a particularly fine collection of New Zealand landscapes. It's on the east side of the sheep market, on City Road. It's on the other side of the road from the public gardens, immediately facing the junction with Hill Road. The Contemporary Art Gallery is on a little road that leads off Station Square, not far from the public gardens. The road ends at the gallery. It doesn't go anywhere else. That's open every day, except Mondays. The Warner Gallery specialises in 19th century art. It's on City Road, near the junction with Crawley Road, on the same side of the road as the public gardens. It's open on weekdays from 9 to 5, and entry is free. Finally, if you're interested in purchasing high-quality artwork, the place to go is Nucleus. You need to go from Crawley Road up through Station Square and east along Hill Road until you get to a small winding road turning off. Go up there, and it's on your right. If you get to City Road, you've gone too far. That is the end of section two. All right. Um, what is the answer for number 15? Fifteen is H. And what do they say? Fifteen is H. They say it north side of Crawley Whitpath. Look at what they say. You should be able to follow it. Right, the north side of Crawley Road. North side of Crawley. Right, that's the north side of Crawley right here. Up the footpath. Right, up the footpath. This is the only footpath on the whole map. That's why knowing vocabulary is so important. It's a vocabulary test. And at the public garden. That means the answer has to be H. Okay, answer has to be H. Ola, it can't be I. Right, there's no footpath over here, Ola. All right, there's no footpath over here. So I think Ola said I. I think so. All right. If, I, if you didn't say that, Ola, then I apologize for, for calling you out. Um, where's Thumb? Number 16. All right, 16 is C. And this is what they said. Heel Road. Across from Bank. Heel Road across from Bank. Right? So the better you learn the directional language, the easier it's going to be. Number 17, answer. All right, 17 is F. All right, what did they say? 17 is F. City Road. City Road. Facing the junction, right? Where's the junction? Facing the junction. Of Hill Road. City Road facing the junction. Here's City Road and Hill Road. Here's the junction. F is facing the junction. F is the only one that's at the junction right here. Junction is right here and it's facing it, right? Right, it's facing it. The answer is F. Uh, Number 18. Mm 
number 18. All right, what do they say? Listen to what they say. On a little road. On a little road. Everybody, one moment, please. Teacher needs his battery or his computer's going to die and there'll be no class. All right, so leads off. Okay, little road that leads off Station Square. Where's the little road that leads off? Here's the little short road, right? I told you it was called a short road. What's the synonym for short? Little, right? Leads off uh, Station Square. What does it mean when leads off? This road right here, this is what it means when they say leads off. Okay, leads off Station Square, right? Little road that leads off Station Square. So you have to know that this is the little road, right? Or a closed road. It's a little road, all right? So it's about vocabulary recognition. Um, number 18, who has 18? I'm sorry, who has 19? What is 19? 19 is I. What did they say? City, Crawley Junction. Where's the City Crawley Junction? City Crawley Junction is right here. Here's the City Crawley Junction. Now, what did they say? Same side as Garden. City Crawley, City Crawley Junction on the same side as the Garden. Right here's the junction. It's on the same side as the junction. It has to be I. It can't be E. Right, E, e is not near the Crawley City Road Junction. E is, near, e is near the Hill Road City Junction. Okay, so for those who pick E, you're looking at the wrong junction. Koduri said E, Maria said E, Ola said E, Ibrahim said E. Right, you guys are looking at the wrong junction. All right, they said what? Crawley City Junction. Crawley City Junction. All right, when they say Crawley City Junction, that's where you should be down here at the bottom of the map, not at the wrong junction. Okay, and number 20, what's number 20? Twenty is B, all right. Now, what did they say? Up through, up through, uh, oh. up through station, east on hill, winding road, winding road, right, right side. Up through. What does it mean? Up through. Up through means going, going from the bottom all the way to through the top. Here's the bottom. Up through station square. Until we hit Hill Road, East on Hill Road, until we hit the Winding Road, right side of the on the right side of the Winding Road, right. So if you knew, that's why vocabulary is so important. If you know what a Winding Road is, even if you were lost in the very beginning, even if you were lost in the very beginning, once they say it Winding Road and this is the only Winding Road on the map, your eyes should go directly to that Winding Road. Okay, it doesn't matter if you got lost somewhere. It doesn't matter if you know you were over on City Road instead of going up through Station Square. It doesn't matter if you went west of the bank instead of going east of the bank on Hill Road. Once they said the words Winding Road, if you knew. Your